Добрый день, уважаемые уч участники. Добро пожаловать Сегодня мы поговорим с вами о жизненных навыках. Добро пожаловать на сессию «Жизненные навыки в цифровом мире». А наши спикеры на реальных примерах поделятся с вами о своих проектах, расскажут, как они развивают жизненные навыки, поделятся опытом. Я надеюсь, что к концу нашей сессии мы все поймем, что же такое жизненные навыки и почему они так важны. Наша сессия проходит на двух языках. Нашего первого спикера, Татьяну Адёркину, руководителя отдела образования и наук в Татьяна, are you here? Да, спасибо. Очень приятно вас видеть. Uh, да, Татьяна, uh, пожалуйста, поделитесь с нами, uh, что подразумевает ЮНИСЕФ под понятием жизни, трансферные Будет очень интересно узнать о вашем фрейме, и как вы его развиваете в нашем framework and the way you develop it here in Kazakhstan. Спасибо большое за ваши вопросы. Thank you for your questions. Indeed, UNICEF is quite actively engaged with all partners and Ministry of Education on defining what the transferable skills are. Let's look at the next slide. Before I start, I would like to mention a definition and talk about a specific framework and pay attention to the current situation. Where are we now? Before, where, where are we before the pandemic and where are we during the pandemic? There are still many questions answered on how to teach and train skills. And we can see that in the world, according to the forecast, by 2030, 825 million of children will leave school without mid-level skills, which is concerning for the employers. 39% of the employers think that many vacancies are left unfilled because the specialists that apply don't get sufficient skills. And an important aspect is an indicator related to those who are left out, unemployed or left out of education or professional development all over the world is 21 percent in Kazakhstan is 9 percent and the OECD average is 11 percent. The pandemic, however, worsened the situation during the remote education period. Many children mentioned that they could not manage time properly, they couldn't concentrate, they faced technical issues. So the transferable skills are still relevant. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about the principles. I would like to mention that UNICEF last year has adopted a framework that we offer to our partners, including the countries who want to develop their own policies on the national level. So these will be the principles. And first of all, is the principle that we need to assist in uh, teaching and learning to obtain transferable skills. And these are different skills. These are the basic skills. This is the numeracy and literacy, the transferable skills. Um, I know D Diana called them life skills or transferable skills. These are also the skills known as 21st century skills, interpersonal skills, and uh, social emotional skills. Uh, why are, are they have helpful? They allow us to be more flexible and adapt to new conditions to solve socioeconomic problems. It's also the question of uh, peer interaction, ways out of a crisis, ways uh, to overcome a trauma and become resilient. And also digital skills. We'll probably talk about them today as well because transferable skills and digital skills are now becoming an integral part of our lives. 
digital skills uh, imply understanding of technologies, information management, and the ways to safely and securely resolve the problems. Uh, and the last category of skills are the professional skills, which are related to technical and professional aspects and uh, professional orientation. Now let's talk about the further principles for skill development. We believe that state policy should include creation of open education systems because schools are not the only source of getting these knowledge and skills. There should be also informal channels and there should be a recognition of these channels through certification or accreditation system. UNICEF also believes that uh, skills uh, should be taught and learned throughout the whole life, taking into account the stages of the life cycle. The world is changing, the lives of people are changing, and therefore we need to update those uh, skills. Regardless of the age of the person, be it a younger person or an older person, this should also be taken into account in state policy. And the last aspect related to the principles is the uh, systemic approach, because it's aimed at using innovations. It's about intersectoral approach to skills development. It's about strengthening sustainability and uh, adapting large scale solutions. Uh, now let's look at the next slide. And I would like to briefly talk of, about what I mean by saying this and what should these programs and comprehensive solutions consist of. UNICEF is developing several programs together with the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection and also with uh, Kazakh National University, Al-Farabi University. Uh, we are developing a program for uh, STEM. It's called UNISAT uh, for uh, NENA satellites for children. So this program is interesting because it brings together um, transferable skills and also professional skills in aerospace industry. But it also is delivered throughout the whole cycle. The participants participate in project planning, design, then they um, assemble those satellites, they test them and they launch them. So we believe that a program like this allows it to be sustainable and adaptive to new professional conditions. And it also is a good networking opportunity. Uh, we are now waiting for applications from uh, girls in Kazakhstan, uh, and we are also expanding it to Central Asia, and hopefully we'll have a lot of applicants. And those uh, girls will also undergo a mentorship program. We will assist them for several months. And also one more ex example, the next slide is the Upshift program. This is also a new format of teaching skills, which might be of interest to you. We have started it with the youth resource centers in 17 regions. There are certainly some regions that were first to enroll into the program. We now covered over 13,000 people and hopefully we will have even more participants because this program gives a certain set of knowledge and skills, uh, preparing people for employment, creation of their own business. So in addition to uh, coming up with the idea, there is also a mentorship program and also grants are allocated for innovative solutions for social matters. So this will be supported later on. So. I'm very happy for those regions who are actively engaged into the program, and I invite other regions uh, to uh, become more Tatiana. active. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Indeed, it's great that UNICEF is uh, organizing the program in Kazakhstan to develop those transferable skills. Tatiana, one more question. You have mentioned that there is a need for intersectoral approach to development of skills. Uh, could you elaborate? What do you mean and uh, how can we proceed? Thank you, Diana, for the question. My colleagues from the government bodies will probably understand me. We believe that 
any program in theory cannot teach skills and there should be a good a cooperation between uh, the educational institution and also mm -hmm. some uh, industry or businesses that would allow to practice it. And UNICEF recommends to have 30% of theory and 70% of practical applications in the program because that will prepare a person for professional activity. And also intersectoral means that Minister of Innovations, Minister of Education need to work together because a new professions appear which require new skills and therefore uh, comprehensive solutions are required. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana, distinguished participants of the conference, our audience, if you have any questions, you can ask them. And after our speakers are done with their presentations, we will have some time allocated for Q&A. So please direct your questions to us. And with that, I see that Tatiana has mentioned the need for collaboration and that only 30% should be covered by theory and 70% should be covered by practice. And with that, I move to our next speaker, Elmira Abri, the Executive Director of the Bureau for Continuous Professional Development. Elmira, please. The floor is yours, please tell us which projects are available right now in the CPD that are aimed at the development of transferable skills and why are you working on that thank you diana you know this topic is highly relevant and i would probably make a step back before i get uh, mm -hmm. to our experience in the bureau according to the study of future of global education uh, until 2035 the socialization skills uh, soft skills so uh, transferable skills will be um, some of the most important ones according to the forecasts. So therefore we need to think very carefully about not only completing some classical educational program and certainly those uh, skills and knowledge are important for the future, but at the same time, we need to make a step towards holistic education. We need to understand where we are going and for which conditions we are preparing the future generations. During the previous session, we mentioned that it's important to build trajectories of development based on preferences and prepare people for life because the specialties can appear, disappear, change, and it's very difficult to forecast what kind of specialties will be there in 10 years. And I think that our most important job is to give the tools uh, to the future generation, which they will use on the market, on the market of professional orientation in their profession. And, you know, overall, I'd like to mention that perception of any product, be it a digital product or educational product, is changing. And we are undergoing a shift when the consumer demand is changing. And as participants of educational process, we cannot ignore that. So look, let's look at an example of technological companies. Apple or Amazon are trendsetters. They identify the directions forward in technology. They identify the products that come to the market and they oh, train us in using their products. On the other hand, such tech giants as Google or Netflix, they are studying consumer experience and they offer their products based on the analysis of behavioral patterns of their audience. And I think that those two approaches are of equal importance. And we try to adapt this experience in the Bureau. We have uh, moved to the product format. We've got new products, and I will talk about it in more detail in the second part of my conversation. I would like to uh, look at the presentation for our products so using the philosophy of transferable skills, and I would like to share some of our secrets. Uh, and many uh, people in product design, they uh, say you should need to look for the pains of a person and then uh, come up with a product. But we think that you need to look at opportunities. And thanks to that, our students, our candidates, 
for the programs and courses, we uh, try to uh, see where they will go with the opportunities provided to them. Where can they develop themselves? That's how our five new products appeared. First, Alion, that is the uh, the platform Alfarabius for uh, school children and uh, students, they allow for professional orientation during uh, school years so that they can test out certain skills to see whether they fit them or not. Uh, also, we offer internships and some uh, like a preliminary test before you choose a profession. The second direction uh, which builds on that is the professional orientation, professional development, or uh, changing the direction of the activities. This is called the University of the Future. I think that it's self-explanatory. This basically talks about opportunities to develop horizontally, get uh, skills from adjacent professions or from completely new directions, and it also allows to grow vertically. And this is all packaged in a consulting format and uh, we are presenting it through a digital platform, which I think is highly relevant right now. And we can cover the needs of any community member, regardless of their age, geographical location, and a, a level of their professional development. So this is our approach. Uh, and then we move to the third step. This is employment. We have the a pro platform. This is for HR technologies and consulting that allows uh, a person to find themselves in profession in the open market, talk to the real employers. By doing this, we uh, complete the cycle and it can continue from any stage uh, during learning. What are the main principles for our platforms and approaches? First, it's uh, person oriented. So we build everything based on the needs of a specific individual. Uh, second principle is continuity. So this uh, human centeredness and continuity reflects our philosophy quite well, which is basically lifelong learning. So that's what we are doing, uh, some of our small secrets. And many people are now talking about holistic approach, about work and life balance or work life training balance. And I think that we are able to achieve it right now. And our whole product line is aimed at the person in the center, be it a school uh, student or a Thank graduate you, student or a professional. Um, Thank you, Elmira. You have mentioned that there are two approaches. The products, I mean, the companies that are trendsetters on the one hand, and the companies that adjust to the other trends or consumer needs on the other hand. In your opinion, which trends do we see in educational sector right now in Kazakhstan? We recently had a very interesting uh, session on change management with representatives of digitalization departments in the regions. And as a result of this transformation session, they have come up with a, a statement which I would like to share here with you. They said that unfortunately, uh, in the post-Soviet countries, the habit is to work uh, top to bottom and we don't have the bottom up approach. We often forget to ask the consumers what they need and we'd ra rather try to press some position on them uh, by thinking that we are experts and we know better. But uh, in fact, we should listen to the audience. So when even the mm, civil servants in the regions are talking about it and are understanding it, then I think that the advanced uh, companies, humanitarian missions, institutions like colleges or schools should also understand this. And I don't think that there is a definitive answer here. We should always have a 360 degree outlook and a change continuously based on the conditions on the market, uh, which we have to comply with on the, uh, on the one hand. But on the other hand, we should not forget that the trends are not creating themselves. And by looking at best practice, we can bring it here and adapt it to the local experience uh, because many projects uh, have problems at exactly this stage when they bring 
international practices, but those practices will not uh, be effective because there was no analysis of the situation or bottom-up analysis. So I think that it's all about balance and it's about holistic and flexible approaches. Thank you very much. And one more question, which is very important. During the previous session, which you moderated, uh, someone mentioned that there is a concept that the uh, educators now need to be the guardians of Values and not knowledge. What do you think about those non-monetary uh, incentives or values? Are they present in BCPD? That's a very interesting question, and it's uh, something very near and dear to my heart. I think that the job of an educator right now is uh, about shifting towards facilitation, and uh, probably Ilya will talk about it and coaching approaches allow us to achieve those results. What are our secrets? Uh, well, we are uh, pro non-monetary incentives and about mindfulness. So we bring together uh, people with common beliefs. We meet as professional communities. Often uh, we uh, have formal and informal meetings. So, for instance, we have a tradition of having uh, tea or coffee together. Certainly now during the pandemic, it's uh, less feasible. We've moved it to online format. But in the years uh, of our operation, in four years, we were able to build a team of highly motivated, active people who wanted to develop themselves and transfer the knowledge and skills to the younger generation. We also organize regular meetings uh, like Alpha Dostar for our students. We help and uh, organize coaching in career orientation. We talk about success stories, transferable skills. And it's not, not only about talking about success stories, it's about uh, preparing the candidates that, that will then go to the market and will not only reach successes, but they will be able to build teams. You know, like in sports, if you don't teach defense or if you don't teach how to fall properly, this could lead to injuries. So the very first thing that the coach will teach their uh, athletic students is falling correctly. And we know that uh, the life is not all hearts and flowers. So, and it's important to learn how to achieve success, but at the same time, provide the skills on how to withstand, how to be resilient in case of failures. I think that this is something we often forget about. We often uh, talk about uh, success, but don't talk about the other side of the coin. And I think that we need to be quite open about it. And that's what we are doing in our team uh, with our products. We help, we explain. Not only will we give tools or transferable skills or a storytelling, we talk about uh, products and storytelling in life and products we try to implement it throughout our work. Thank you, Elmira, for very deep thoughts, and I uh, could relate uh, to what you were saying because you were talking about our products, but now we are moving from local to global, and I would like to invite our next speaker, Maya Fasiaro. Maya is the executive director of the John Smith Trust in the UK, which, is, which has two fellowship programs for people from uh, post-Soviet uh, countries. Maya will share what, what this program is, why this is being welcome. implemented. Maya, welcome. Thank you, Diana. It's really lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm just trying to share my screen now for, uh, for the presentation. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the, the John Smith Trust and our approaches to fostering what we call leadership skills, but which are, I believe are really the same thing as, as um, transferable skills. And then the, the kind of impact um, that we have observed in the fellows that we, um, 
that, uh, that come on our program. Yeah, can we ask you, uh, can we ask you ground? to uh, can you go to full the screen? full screen? Uh, if you press F5, it should work. Yes. So F5. Can you see my presentation now? Oh, F5. Mm -hmm. Yep. Full screen. We can see the presentation, yep. but we need to make it full screen. Okay. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. So, firstly, about the the John Smith Trust. So, the the John Smith Trust uh, is a a living memorial to one of. Uh, the UK's uh, most outstanding leaders of his generation, uh, John Smith, who was both an, a QC, so a, um, a lawyer and uh, and a member of parliament. Um, and the trust is uh, a living embodiment of, uh, of the values that he stood for, uh, good governance, rule of law and, and social justice. Um, the John, nowadays, the John Smith Trust um, exists in order to harness and strengthen the ambition and the, the passion, skills and knowledge of young leaders from the former Soviet region um, and uh, to equip them to make a positive contribution to their societies. So we run uh, two fellowship programs, so two month long fellowship programs uh, every year, apart from right now in the pandemic, um, uh, one for the uh, Central Asian region, so for our five Central Asian countries, and another for um, the wider Europe region. You can see. Um, our fellows are uh, mid-career professionals working in all sorts of different uh, sectors, so from politics and public administration at the national level and the regional level, in media, civil society, law, social enterprise, or any sector really that can, can um, be connected with the rule of law, social justice issues, uh, and, uh, and good governance. Uh, our young professionals are aged between uh, 25 and 35 and, and uh, obviously are from the countries that, um, that our program targets. So the fellowship program is um, structured around three core elements. One is the, the core program, which consists of workshops and debates, um, visits and meetings with uh, high level Sort of officials and um, practitioners from from all walks of life, um, and this this part of the program gives fellows a unique insight into the UK's political and um, uh, civil society and the and institutions, the inner workings of the of the UK. The second component is um, the at the individual level. All our fellows come to the program with. Uh, a draft of an, an individual action plan, which is part of, so, so which is a piece of work that they are working on in their professional life um, that they want to develop and enhance by uh, spending time in the UK. And we develop an individually tailored program for each fellow to spend a week um, developing that plan further by speaking with, with professionals and practitioners in their sphere. Um, and the third element, which is, I think, the most interesting here for the discussion on transferable skills, is um, a real focus on developing leadership skills. So we uh, spend, so fellows spend time reflecting uh, on their own leadership skills, receive some practical training, and also the opportunity to, to practice those, those um, skills. We view this whole experience of being in the UK for a month as, as experiential learning. So learning through reflection on doing. It's not about spending time um, in, in lectures or you know, making reams of notes. It's about um, having meetings and discussions. So getting first-hand insights into uh, 
into the system here, into civil society organizations, into um, the public administration, etc., by having meetings and discussions uh, with, with practitioners. Um, it's about seeing with your own eyes, as we all know, I'm sure that seeing with your own eyes is, be, is far better than, than being told. So, so we organise visits here in this the middle photo, you can see a visit to the Scottish Parliament. Um, and yeah, so again, speaking to people and, and the opportunity to ask questions and, and really feel what it feels like to, to uh, work and be in these places. And then the third the, the important element of the experimental, experiential learning is about having the space and the time uh, to reflect um, on your own skills and um, discuss them with others and share them with like-minded professionals. So our program design is, is all about um, improving and, and enhancing uh, fellows learning, so their skills and knowledge, their attitudes, so in terms of their values and, uh, and motivation, and a belief in their own agency. Um, and also providing linkages, so connections between fellows and uh, between people and institutions in the UK and the fellows' own countries. Um, fostering kind of collaborations, so uh, combining expertise and energy with each other, and also uh, combined le learning, so knowledge and experience between each other. So those are the linkages. Um, and... Sorry, there we go. Yes, uh, uh, sorry. The linkages are also about the so the, in a, the when fellow when the fellows leave the fellowship program, they join our alumni network, which is nowadays uh, around just under uh, five hundred uh, strong, uh, where they continue to to develop those those um, connections and, and linkages. Uh, so, so the, while the program takes place face to face here in the UK, the alumni community also, in normal times, meets uh, uh, once a once a year. But um, nowadays, we also do a lot online. So we have online sessions and workshops, and also provide some some um, uh, on demand video content to to continue uh, developing skills. Sorry, I have a, somewhere uh, my I've lost one oh, one slide there. Sorry, no, no, no. Okay, it's gone. Um, so I was going to talk about the the uh, the approaches that we take to fostering leadership and transferable skills. Um, so so. Um, these, the leadership skills that fellows develop on their on the program are all about so soft transferable skills. So the the first time that fellows encounter the, this is during what we call the leadership weekend. So uh, on upon arrival in the UK, fellows spend time uh, reflecting on what makes um, a good leader. So uh, it's an opportunity for self-reflection on different leadership styles and also a chance to identify their own strengths and weaknesses. And during that weekend, uh, the fellows also develop their own individual plan on how to strengthen and, um, and practice the, the skills where they have weaknesses during the programme and in the 12 months after the programme. Uh, the fellows also receive some practical training, for example, in communication skills, in debating, uh, storytelling, uh, how, networking, uh, managing their own emotions and convincing others and motiv motivating others and teamwork, uh, for example, also how to have difficult conversations and um, how to stay motivated themselves and how to motivate others. So the month-long 
fellowship program also serves as a microcosm or like a safe space to practice those skills that fellows have developed or, or have, have received training in during the, the program. Um, and it's not just during the sessions of the fellowship program, but also in the margins of the, the session that fellows get to practice those skills. So when it comes to um, long session, uh, you know, long days and motivating the, their, um, the other members of their cohort, for example. So lots of things happen in the margins. And then, so after the fellowship program, fellows are invited to put um, all of the learning into practice in their professional lives. Um, and then obviously also use the alumni network to continue, um, continue learning. So then the long-term impact that we see on fellows, on, on young professionals who have gone through the program are mostly related to uh, confidence. So we see that fellows gain a lot of confidence from having spent a month uh, with us. Um, lots of fellows report that that they come back uh, with with greater motivation to to contribute towards their country's development and towards their society. They also talk about inspiration, uh, being inspired to uh, do new things and uh, and keep going with with them um, what they have started in their careers we've also seen a lot of um, career changes and promotions as a as a result of the pro uh, of participation in the program um, and fellows also really appreciate the access uh, to a network of like-minded professionals from across the region so i just wanted to share with you a few quotes um, from people who have recently participated in, in the program. Um, one here from, from Kyrgyzstan talking about how um, she identified her, my, she says, uh, through the program, I have identified my strong and weak qualities, and I think I can do more, and I will, make, I will take more responsibility to make a difference in my country. Another here from Tajikistan saying, that um, talking about the outstanding sense of community amongst the fellows that, and says that, the, that in the four weeks, in this short period of time, we can call ourselves a, a family, so, which points to the, the connections that are made. And then uh, one of our um, older fellows looking back now uh, remembers her fellowship program saying, the, the John Smith Trust experience taught me not to fear being challenged and helped uh, empower me with the understanding of what you what you can achieve with the proper goals and right efforts. So that's it in terms of um, uh, what I wanted to present. Um, I'm happy to take questions and um, and be in touch with anyone who'd like to ask more. Maya, Thank you very uh, much, Maya, for your presentation. We can see that uh, based on the example of развитие в целом, да, вот этих трансферовых жизненных навыков, и вы так очень хорошо продемонстрировали нам результаты, когда все выпускники, они становятся более такими мотивированными для развития всех других навыков, включая профессиональные, цифровые, ну, естественно, уже владеющие вами. Ну, и дальше я хотела бы перейти к нашему спикеру из Москвы, Илья Шмелев, он является доктором психологических наук, преподавателем высшей школы экономики Илья как раз внедряет коучинг в систему образования, и на своем примере, на примере своего проекта, Илья, пожалуйста, расскажите нам, какое место в современном образовании выведите коучинг в современной образовании? Здравствуйте. Say hello to all of you and a few words in Kazakh. Say to all of you, as it was stated before, my task is to uh, pay more attention to the role of coaching in the contemporary education system. Uh, before I get into the 
discussion of the topic, first I would need to explain what coaching is. Uh, a lot has been said about coaching, but uh, uh, in uh, the environment, uh, there is a lot of things about uh, trend coaching. Many people often um, imply very posing things with it. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to find the context. Uh, the coach should be accompanying the uh, coachee in search for solutions. And um, uh, the, during the coaching process, the person may change the priorities and change the trajectory of uh, development. And speaking about education in particular, the idea of the coach is to facilitate, as I said, um, uh, the coachee or the students or the learners uh, to find the solutions that would facilitate real uh, disclosure of the internal capacity and potential. And based on the second definition, the coaching is part of, of facilitating uh, enhancement of effectiveness, the training and development of the person. And uh, so that uh, during the process of um, uh, coaching, the person could build uh, the internal coach uh, who will help developing and self-developing of the person because the motivation indeed should come from inside. An important uh, thing here is that uh, the external uh, support is uh, uh, internalized so that the person uh, supports himself during the development. Uh, can you see my presentation well, colleagues? Okay, thank you. Uh, coaching is uh, the pioneer of uh, coaching and one of the developers of coaching team to uh, Goldie says, uh, coaching is the art of creating the environment uh, with the in interrogation and the behavior that would facilitate the uh, movement of person to the desired objective so that he would be satisfied. And uh, Mira mentioned that many people on this path uh, may get broken and due to certain collisions cannot raise back and continue moving. And the idea of coaching is for the person to move ahead and, uh, by himself and at the same time to get uh, uh, pleasure and satisfaction. And the idea of coaching is to disclose, uh, disclose the potential of the personality to maximize the, his own productivity and uh, performance. And as it was mentioned before, uh, uh, the idea of coaching is also to be personified so that it is based on the internal capacities and uh, uh, capabilities of the person to be able to develop. Uh, how coaching can support the development of the uh, life skills uh, is a very important question. Uh, I think we should recall the model of Byrne, who said that uh, there are three ego um, conditions inside us. One is I want, uh, my internal child, these are my needs, uh, my desires, my internal uh, wishes. The second one is uh, internal can, uh, this is the adult who can uh, relatively assess uh, his opportunity his capacity and to assess the current situation and assess uh, his own capability to overcome. The third one is I have to. Uh, this is quite, when we collaborate, what we often come across is when the teacher or the educator will collaborate, uh, interact with the a learner uh, from the status of uh, I need to to I want to. And the child uh, can become an adult only when he can take responsibility. And the idea of coaching is to get from the vertical system to the horizontal system. We can very often come across with that in the management. When the manager serves as the parent to the uh, subordinates and we can quite often see that in in the educational institutions when uh, there is the right opinion who is the manager and the executive people but often don't even understand what will be the consequences of the actions that they will take. And uh, what coaching facilitates is to transfer from the conditions uh, uh, relation between the parent and the child, uh, which is the classical training, uh, to the stage of uh, adult to adult. Uh, 
I'm okay, you're okay, I can see my area of responsibility, I can understand it, and I can take the, uh, my decision in, in the trajectory of internal development. A lot was said today about the lifelong learning. Therefore, it's very important that the person learns to learn, because quite often people enroll into certain educational institutions because they were do so by the employer or if it's embedded in the internal uh, learning plan, but they don't want to do that. And if the person is not willing and he doesn't want to take responsibility for that, most likely this kind of development or training will not be efficient. And when we're talking about coaching, it's at the level of adult to adult, and therefore, if you look at this coaching approach to education, it, uh, achieve partnership and equality because I'm not uh, a person who teaches you, but when the, both the teacher or the educator and the student are equal, equal not because they uh, are not subordinate, but because uh, they both serve as the coach serves as a facilitator that is to create conditions and the person will find ways to find information into way, the way of development. Second is that don't provide uh, praise. We quite often uh, say whether it's bad or good and uh, it's uh, uh, valueless in the entire process of teaching. Next is the research uh, aim of the collaboration whereby the a coach creates conditions and the coach will find uh, ways to implement his research uh, interest. Uh, the next is the stimulation of convergent and divergent uh, thinking. The focus on closing capacity and deviating from appraisals, whether it's good or bad, and uh, using feedback so that uh, instead of looking uh, for getting good marks, uh, it would not always provide the quality of education. I saw a lot of studies uh, saying that uh, quite often the marks uh, would not correlate to the uh, knowledge that the person achieves. And uh, we should uh, get from mark to the feedback, uh, showing what is already good and where I could uh, arrive at. Uh, what uh, can be developed by coaching? Uh, we provide uh, deep learning. Uh, he recently, one of the officials in Kazakhstan, Mr. Smith, of, uh, at the International Conference of Coaching, stated the following. It is important that the coach serves as the big ear, and it's important for us to hear and uh, listen and hear. Uh, second is empathy, understanding the uh, emotions and feelings of the other people uh, and believing in the opportunities and this is important for the current uh, current educator is that it only operate as the parent of the child it will not always facilitate real training and learning of the person and another important skill that is stimulated uh, by coaching is the desire to take responsibility because I can see the value of education that I get. Next is the striving to achieving a goal and striving to self-develop. Uh, we can look at the success formula by Thomas Leonard uh, saying that if uh, uh, classical knowledge, skills, and um, experience can only provide 10% of success. If it's the uh, way of thinking of an adult who realistically understands that it's 40% of experience of success and the environment is 50% of success. And the idea, of the task of the coach is to create conditions to self development, and the idea of the coach to find uh, the environment and the opportunities for development. Uh, what is the role of coaching in the contemporary education, which is the key issue? I uh, recall the vivid example that happened in Norway, uh, where in particular in 2001, they happened that uh, one of the educational schools uh, uh, this is the picture of that school, uh, was uh, at the age of uh, bankruptcy because uh, due to the low ranking, people didn't want to study there. But they agreed with one of the master training of the International Association of Coaches, um, a young Christian, uh, who started to cooperate and introduce the tools of um, coaching in their schooling system. And the effect was as follows. In four years, it became one of the uh, top uh, schools in Norway. And this was uh, further repeated in another school, 
получился тот же самый эффект. And the effect was the same in 2006, uh, where when the study was carried out at the schools that uh, in no way started to introduce and integrate uh, uh, coaching uh, tools uh, uh, at the level of adult adult many uh, started being uh, rated as number one and many schools are now uh, getting in, in the same educational process uh, coach, coaching is also actively introduced in the corporate universities these are the examples of companies where we uh, collaborated or the universities or the trainers and coaches who were trained in our international association and in this regards I'm not going to comment on that uh, but there are certain studies that show the efficiency of using coaching in business Why do I show that is that uh, there are very few studies yet, and these are the only ones in the education because this area is only starting to develop because in coaching this uh, good results uh, but the question is why we cannot use it in education. therefore the task uh, which in my view is uh, uh, we are facing is that how coaching could be efficient in the current education because it's not a secret that many global universities are actively introducing and integrating coaching in the learning uh, learning process in particular in high school economics we use the coaching very much and we noted that students who study coaching in our master programs in particular in psychology department they can easily uh, cope with the learning process it's not easy uh, anyway uh, but when they introduce coaching in their practice their learning process becomes more efficient and the percentage of people who get their diplomas defend their diplomas uh, uh, got much higher and it also enhanced the feedback between the students and the teachers and with a perfect was better quality of uh, uh, research works and design uh, and project work and better signing of uh, better preparation of the coursework uh, papers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Действительно, мы сегодня, уважаемые коллеги, разобрали все инструменты, которые позволяют развивать жизненные навыки. Life, uh, и uh, я думаю, что после сегодняшней сессии мы с вами все начнем uh, и прим применять в нашем мире, в нашей ежедневной жизни. Practice. Хочу поблагодарить Now еще раз life. наших спикеров, like Татьяну, Эльмиру, Майю, Илью, за ваш опыт, за ценные uh, советы, которые мы сегодня дали всему нашему тех-сообществу Казахстана и даже, наверное, глобального страны. Страны, я думаю, нас слушают. Спасибо всем большое. Я всем желаю продуктивного дня, отличного. Day and great Friday. Thank you.